So, with that said, I want to take our attention now to, God, to, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, we're studying through this book verse by verse. And today we're picking up in verse 20. John chapter 12 and verse 20. And we're beginning today to look at the topic of the purpose of the cross. The purpose of the cross. Now, just so you know, we won't get too far today. Uh, my intention is not to move rapidly, but to understand what we hear from the Word of God. So we'll work our way as far as the Lord will allow this morning. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. The Word of God says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then there came Philip, and who was of Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies and remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, but he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me... Him my Father will honor. I guess you could say the besetting sin of the pragmatic, style-conscious, evangelical church today has always been that they shamelessly borrow fads and talking points from the unbelieving world. I remember J.B. Phillips many years ago in his paraphrase of the New Testament translated Romans chapter 12 verse 2 this way. He said, don't let the world squeeze you into its image. I would say, well, we've come far away from that. We've swallowed the world and taken all of it in. Today's evangelicals evidently do not understand and do not believe that the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God. Virtually every theory and ideology and amusement that captures the fancy of the secular pop world and pop culture are eventually adopted, slightly adapted, and perhaps even cloaked in spiritual sounding language, propped up with spiritual proof text, and then peddled as an issue as if it is vitally important to the evangelical church. That is precisely how evangelicals in the last Mid-century became obsessed with several topics such as positive thinking and self-esteem and even Christian psychology. After that came the marketing savvy, savvy and promotional strategies and even the political priorities of the moral majority. By the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, it was post-modernism in the church, repackaged and aggressively promoted as the emergent church. Today... In our church, we're battling a new fight, a new battle. It's critical race theory, feminism, intersectional theory, the LGBT advocacy, progressive immigration policies, animal rights, and other left-wing political causes that are vying for political audience and to be accepted among the church. And they're all under this whole topic of what is called social justice. But wrapped around all of that, is the topic of victim status and the idea that everyone is a victim now of something. And with that comes a threat against the gospel of Christ and the church itself. And there have been many threats throughout the history of the church that have come. And most of the time you can see the storm clouds rising and you can see the storm coming and you have some time to prepare but occasionally there are threats that come in such subtle ways and sometimes stunning, stunningly and with such force and suddenness that it's hard to even get your handle on it. Such is the case of the social justice approach to racism in the church. Four years ago, I would have never thought that we were going to deal with the probability that the church would be divided over the topic of race. But that's exactly where we are today. And I believe, as some do, and I agree with them, that this is probably one of the greatest threats facing the church today, unlike any of the other issues that have been faced in the church. It has the potential to destroy and eliminate the unity of the body of Christ. It has the potential to destroy its testimony, which is a message of unity and oneness in Christ. 
And then it has even a more dramatic effect of removing the necessity of a sinner's need for the gospel because of the overemphasis of victim. You do not see yourself as a perpetrator of the the uh, of God himself or a perpetrator of the commandments of God and in violation of his word. Rather, you are a victim deserving of some type of remuneration, whether it's mercy or status or position. So with that said, you need to understand that Christians, as Christians, we should stand together and affirm what the Bible says in Leviticus 19, where it says we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we stand in unity with that and we affirm that. And there should never be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ ever any hint of racial hatred. Ever. Racism is a stain on the American history that has left shame and injustice and horrible violence in its wake. The institution of slavery and the costly civil war left a deep racial divide and bitter resentment on every side. No sensible person would even suggest that we have found ourselves completely void of that idea today. It still finds its hearts available to believe those kind of thoughts. But you need to also note that the laws that are given in this land do not have the capacity to change the heart of man. A person who is filled with prejudice, a person who is filled with bitterness cannot be changed by external laws. Thankfully, however, with that said, I would say that in our American culture, we haven't made much progress. It's not like it was 50 years ago. In some attitudes and hearts and minds of people, their hearts and minds have changed. We could go as far as to say that white supremacy and all other expressions of purposeful and willful ideological racism are almost universally condemned. As Christians, we all know, though, that the heart is evil. The heart is full of sin. And even with that said, there are still those who harbor resentment and hatred toward other people of different races. There are people increasing in number today who are obsessed with this issue in the church. In fact, they would look for every opportunity to believe that anything you say or believe or if you disagree with them would be at its root racism. And yet the issue of racial division and the focus that we have in our secular society, both in the world and in the media, has been adopted by the evangelical culture and is promoted as if it is the issue. Now you need to understand that this type of approach that we find in the evangelical church today is really echoing the wisdom of the world and not the gospel-centered approach. And what do I mean by that is this, is that many times today, people are taking a worldly approach to deal with these issues rather than a God-centered, gospel-centered, Christ-centered approach. It is quite common these days for Christian leaders to address the issue and to call for people who have never harbored a racist thought in their life to say that they are to confess racism on behalf of their ancestors who were racist. Expressions of repentance have been demanded by white, of white evangelicals for no actual transgression at all because it is said of them that they have received what is called, quote, white privilege. One influential evangelical leader in an article titled, We Await Repentance for the Assassination of Dr. King, wrote, and I quote, Racial reconciliation in the church cannot even start until white Christians confess their parents' and grandparents' complicity in the murdering of a man who only preached love and justice. That's coming out of evangelical sources. So by this view, then, social justice By a person's skin color, you can be automatically guilty of the crimes of your ancestors. Automatically guilty of what someone else has done, even if it is a crime. Now, if that is accurate, if this is accurate, then it would follow suit then that every single American is guilty of the crimes of Hitler. Because what Hitler did... We would claim then that all of the Americans sat by apathetically and didn't do anything while he rose up on the scene and committed his evil atrocities. We would go as far as to say also that many pastors who are in the pulpits are no longer qualified to be in the pulpits because of the history of the sins of their ancestors. In fact, I would be completely disqualified because my grandfather died in a drunken stupor playing poker. But I'm not guilty for his actions. 
I'm not responsible for what he did. There's nothing remotely just about that idea whatsoever. In fact, whenever we find what the scripture teaches, it tells us there that you and I are guilty for the sins that we commit, not the sins of someone else. And that we are responsible to repent of our sins, not the sins of someone else. And I would go as far as to say it is impossible for you and I to repent of someone else's sins. As Christians, we are committed to the authority of Scripture and the truth of the gospel. And you are here today because I believe that you are committed to those truths. And we have better answers than the world can give to these issues of racism and injustice and human cruelty than any of the societal pundits and talks shows have today. We have the cross of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God who leads us in all love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. As Christians, we have been reconciled to God. And as a result of that, we understand the need to reconcile with one another. The Bible teaches us that we are to forgive one another just as Christ has forgiven us. That we should not be divided over the topics of race or culture or any of those other issues. We are peacemakers and lovers of all men. We do not seek vengeance. We let vengeance reside in the hands of God. And we are to forgive seven times 70. 70 times seven. I deplore, and I want to emphatically state that I deplore racism and cruelty and strife in all of its forms. I'm convinced that the only long-term solution to this issue is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have so long left what we should believe that the power of the gospel is sufficient to change the hearts and minds of men. We always seem to fall back on the pragmatism of politics and the pragmatism of morality and the pragmatism of societal psychology or whatever and say that that is the solution to our problems when in fact it is simply this, to proclaim Jesus Christ as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior that can satisfy the just demands of a holy God and can change you from the inside out. Evangelicals who are saying the most, as I quote one author, and the loudest these days about what is referred to as, quote, social justice seem to have a very different perspective. Their rhetoric certainly points in a different direction, demanding repentance and reparations from one ethnic group for the sins of the ancestors of another. This author goes on and says, that is the language of law, not the gospel. It is the language of worldly politics, not the message of Jesus Christ. You say, now, Pastor, how in the world did you get there? I got there because this passage that we have in our hands here this morning introduces us to one of the most clearly biblical divides in all of history, the division between the Jews and the Gentiles. It was such a marked issue in that day that the Jews did not believe that the Gentiles could be saved. In fact, they did everything they could to avoid the Gentile people. And the thought of that a Gentile could actually be part of the kingdom of God was anathema to a Jewish mind. And so whenever we come to our passage this morning, we are being introduced to a theme that is found in all of the word of God. So often it is missed, but it is a theme found through all of the word of God that God has a desire to save all peoples. All kinds of peoples. And that the body of Christ is made up of all kinds of peoples. It is not a certain color, a certain creed, a certain standard, a certain cultural group. It is not a certain geographical location. It is if you're a sinner and God is gracious to you, you can be saved. And that puts all of us in the same boat. Amen? Well, quickly as I review, and we're going to get into this more as we look at the Word of God and what it has to say about that. And frankly, I could care less what the politics and the politicians have to say about this. And I could care less about what many of the evangelicals are saying about it because they're biblically inaccurate. And the problem is we need to get back to what Scripture says about this. Let it be the rule. Let it be the standard. Let it be the plumb line by which everything else in our life is governed by. 
I will tell you, and I've told you this before, whenever I was uh, pastoring another church many years ago now, Angela and I were newly married just a couple of years, and she had a very dear friend of hers that lived in Jacksonville, Florida, and she was a young black lady. We invited her up to our church. We brought her to our church. I was the pastor of that church. And I was somewhat naive because I actually believed that people who said they were Christians believed the gospel. And that they believed that we're all sinners in the sight of God and that we're all one in Christ. Oh, did I get a surprise. Whenever we brought our friend to the church, oh, there was no clear animosity and hatred at the church. But afterward, as the pastor, I got an earful. Words of hatred and animosity and how dare you. Well, the next Sunday, being the preacher I am, I preached on love your neighbor black or white and stirred it up some more. (laughs) I honestly do not believe that a person can harbor the kind of racism and hatred in their hearts that many have today and be a believer. I don't see how that works. I don't see how you can be a Christian and have that. Now, I know that you can be born into that, and I know that you can be raised in that, but I know that whenever you come to Christ, God in his work of sanctification will purge that out of you. He will purge that out of you. Peter had to go through that in the New Testament. Had a serious problem with the Gentiles. But God had to wake him up to the truth of the body of Christ. Well, let me remind you where we are in our context here in John chapter 12. If you remember, beginning in verse 1, we follow chapter 11, and we were witnesses of the resurrection of Lazarus, which was a profound, monumental pinnacle of the ministry of Christ. It was a mountain peak, if you will. It really was the end of the public ministry of Christ as far as miracles is concerned. It was a miracle of miracles because Jesus raised someone who had been dead for four days, So dead that his body was already decaying in the grave. And it was so miraculous, so powerful, so clear a display of the deity of Christ that crowds grew. Crowds grew all over as a result of that. They were coming to see Lazarus and coming to see what Jesus had done and to see Jesus himself. Jesus had come back to Bethany and there he had a supper with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. You remember that? They were at the house of Simon the leper and Mary was worshiping at the feet of Jesus, and Martha was serving our Lord, worshiping him through her service. And we saw the great, great contrast of the worship of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the tremendous devotion and love that they had for Christ. And in the backdrop was this Judas Iscariot, who was a man who was desirous of whatever he could gain from the ministry of Christ and hoping for position and esteem And hoping for more money, as we already noted in verse 5 and 6. But Jesus tells him in verse 7, let her alone, for she has kept this for my burial. The poor you always have with me, with you rather, but me you do not always have. And Jesus was alluding to the future departure through his death, resurrection, and ascension. As we all noted, the great many of the Jews came to listen to what Jesus had to say and to see Lazarus and Some of them, as a result of Lazarus' resurrection, believed on Christ, and that didn't set well with the Pharisees because now they had evidence that was very clear and irrefutable that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and indeed God because he resurrected a man from the grave. So they tried to put not only Jesus to death, but to kill the evidence. They wanted to put Lazarus to death. Then we move to that next very important event in the life of our Lord, as indicated in verse 12, where he comes into Jerusalem now. Many believe that would be Sunday, Palm Sunday. He comes riding upon a donkey. He comes in there in humility, but also declaring peace and not war. He comes fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, which would have been a clear signal to those who understood and believed what the Old Testament taught, that he was the Messiah, The disciples even stated in verse 16, did not fully understand what was going on there and didn't really grab it until finally he was glorified. Therefore, the people who were there with him, as it says in verse 16, he saw Lazarus and they they bore witness to the resurrection of Lazarus. For this reason, in verse 18, it says the people also went out to meet Christ and he had done the sign. So there's a huge amount of people. This is like 
unbelievable the amount of people that are in Jerusalem at this time. Some estimate as many as two million people who are there to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And Jesus is there declaring himself to be Messiah by clear evidence of fulfilling messianic prophecy. These same groups of people, many of them that are hailing him by crying out, Hosanna, save us now is what the word means, are going to be many of the same crowd that are going to cry out, crucify him later on in the Gospel of John. The fickle crowd are yet truly believing. Some are genuine, some are not. That moves us now to verse 20. And the lesson we're going to begin looking at today, we won't finish all of it, but we're going to begin looking at it. There are three points in this passage that I read to you this morning that I would like us to address this Sunday and next Lord's Day. The first would be the seeking of the separated, the second, the sacrifice of the Savior, and third, the selflessness of service. We're just going to cover the seeking of the separated. Look at verse 20. It says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Now this is interesting because John introduces this to us almost as if it is like a footnote because he doesn't really tell us a whole lot about it other than there are Greeks that come, these are Gentiles, these are Greek-speaking Greeks, and they come there to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. And by the way, there were many of those Gentiles who did that. They even had the court of the Gentiles at the tabernacle. Some of them were proselytes. They had converted to Judaism from their paganism, but they were coming to, to celebrate the Passover feast. And it seems like it's interesting that out of nowhere that John introduces this to us, that there were certain Greeks there among them who came to worship. And you would say, well, why exactly is that? My belief is that it is feeding what is to be taught later on in the same passage in chapter 12, verse 32, where it says that Jesus says, if I, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Now, many have taken that and misunderstood it. In fact, many today have taught what is called prevenient grace from that very text, saying that Jesus is drawing all men to himself, drawing all men to salvation in a sense that he elevates everyone to a position of insight, understanding, enlightenment, so that then they can, of their own will, choose Christ and come to Christ. That is called prevenient grace. And they base it upon this text here found in the text of John 12, 32. If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Well, we're going to see why that is not the case as we look at the text itself. And I believe the reason why it is not the case is because of the introduction here in verse 20 of certain Greeks. We've been primarily Jewish for most of the time, right? And now all of a sudden, John introduces to us these Greeks who are there to worship at the feast. It's an amazing thing because it also helps us to understand what was meant in verse 19 when it says the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, they say, the world has gone after him. Now, they didn't mean just the Jews. They meant the Greeks. The Gentiles are going after Christ, not just the Jews. In their mind, the world encompassed Jews and Gentiles. And you need to understand that whenever he uses the word world in verse 19, he's not referring to every single human being on the planet. He's not talking about that. He's using it in the Johannian sense, the way the gospel of John was written. You'll find that the word world is often used to reflect Jews and Gentiles. The Jews and basically the rest of the world, which would be the Gentiles. To show you that, I'll just flip through a couple of passages. You're there in John 12, look at verse 47. You see, John used this word world like this all the time. When you see the word world, if you could just for a moment in your own mind to get a better understanding of what he means by that, substitute it with these words, not just Jews, but Gentiles also. All right. Look at it in verse 47 of John 12. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him for I did not come to judge the world of Jews only, but Gentiles but to save the world of Jews and not just Jews only, but Gentiles. And John 1 29, if you could back up a little bit, we'll go through a few verses to show you this. In John, the gospel of John chapter one, verse 29, 
It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, he's not saying that he died for all the sin of all the world in the sense that he took away all the penalty of all sin that had ever been committed. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this. He's simply saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the Jews, but not just the Jews, the Gentiles also. And then in chapter 4, in verse 42, you see it used this way again. Then they said of, to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that indeed this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And in their mind, it was the Savior of the Jews, but not the Jews only, the Gentiles also. And in John eighteen twenty, Jesus answered him and said, I spoke openly to the world. What world is he talking about? I spoke openly to the Jews, but also the Gentiles. He says, I also taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet in secret, and I have said nothing in secret. So he contrasts the synagogues with the world, saying that I spoke to the Jews and I spoke to the Gentiles. You don't need to turn to this one, but in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, it says, And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here to us also. And the world refers to the Jewish world and the Gentile world. That's the way John uses it. That's the way Luke used it in the book of Acts. Now you turn back to a passage in the gospel of John chapter 3 that we're all familiar with. Now let's read it the way John used it. He said this, for God so loved the world. What world? The world not only of the Jews, but the Gentiles also. In the Jewish mindset, whenever the Jew heard the word world, he thought Gentiles, pagans, idolaters, worshipers of uh, idols. Those who don't have the true Messiah. Those who don't have the true scriptures. So whenever he said this really radical thought to a Jewish mind, it would be radical. That Jesus did not come to the Jews only, but he came to the Gentiles also. He came to the people of Israel, but he came to the Greeks also. He came to all the other people groups in the world. So in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. If you believe in Christ, you can have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world of the Jews only, but the Gentiles also to condemn the world of the Jews only, but the Gentiles also, but that the world that is the Jews and the Gentiles also could be saved through him. You see how it's used? You see, we don't get it sometimes because we live here in North America and we don't understand the mindset of the Jewish person. The Gentiles were outside. They were not those that belonged to the covenants. They did not belong to Israel and they were not even desirous. That is, the Jews did not have any desire whatsoever of them being part of it. As the recipients of God's Old Testament covenant promises, the Jews consider themselves superior to the Gentiles. Superior to the pagan Gentiles of that world. For example, rather than proclaiming God's message to the Gentile city of Nineveh, what did Jonah do? Whenever he was told to go and preach the word of God of repentance to the city of Nineveh, which was a group of Gentile pagans, you know what Jonah did? Oh no, I'm not going. I'm going a different direction. And he took off a different direction. In fact, whenever he finally did go, as God providentially turned him around through the fish, You remember that? He reluctantly went and preached to them the gospel. They repented. And you know what his reaction was? Glory, glory. Someone else is coming to the kingdom. Absolutely not. He was filled with anger, it says in chapter 4, verse 1. He was filled with anger. In other words, he didn't think that these people were deserving of the very covenants of God and the grace of God. How dare God save a Gentile? So deeply ingrained was this in the Jews that even as I told you earlier, Peter had a very difficult time with this. After being converted, being genuinely saved, the Spirit of God had to work in him and through him, sanctifying him to help remove this prejudice that he had in him, this very serious racism that he had in his heart regarding the Gentile people. If you remember, whenever he was told to go and to to preach to the 
the household of Cornelius, which was a Gentile. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, whenever he arrived there, he told them this, this. He said, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner. In other words, you do know that I'm here and it's unlawful for me to be here to even tell you the truth. It took a vision from God to transform his thoughts. You remember that? God lowered out of heaven a net with all kinds of animals in it, unclean and clean, and said, kill and eat. And then Peter responded, you know, I don't do that. I don't eat any unclean animal. And God says, whatever I've made clean, it's clean. You eat. And through that, God taught Peter the tremendous truth of what God had desired all along with the body of Christ. When Cornelius and the other Gentiles heard Peter's message there, they believed, and it says they received the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 10 and verse 45, it says this, all the circumcised believers, that would be the Jews, who came with Peter were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They were stunned that God actually would go as far as to save a Gentile. And Peter returned to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, verse 3. And it says there, those believers who were there who were the circumcised took issue with him saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Well, in his defense, Peter related the vision that God gave to him and how God demonstrated to him and those that were there with him at the conversion of Cornelius and his household that they had received the same Holy Spirit that they had received on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And it was only then, finally, in verse 18 of Acts chapter 11, that those that were accusing Peter said, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life. They were willing to acknowledge, finally, yes, God is saving the Gentiles. And by the way, for your own personal study, if you want to do this, you can go through the book of Acts and you can see in chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 10, and chapter 19 of the book of Acts, you'll see that there is the belief first and then a subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit later. Some have misinterpreted that to mean that you get a subsequent baptism of the Spirit later. That's not what's being taught there. What was being taught is this. God is saving not only the Jews, but he's saving the Gentiles. An apostle or an associate of apostle had to be present after those people had believed to see that they had received the Holy Spirit so that whenever they finally came together as a body, a body of believers, they couldn't say, hey, I got the Holy Spirit, you didn't. We're Jews, you're Gentiles, you know, whatever. They all got the same Spirit. They all got the same Holy Spirit. They all got the same salvation. That was the reason why God was doing that. That's why there was a delay so that it could prove that they were of the same body. It was always God's desire to do that, to reach the Gentiles. It was against the mentality, no doubt, of the Jewish people. They didn't understand it. And even though that is true, I believe that some of the words that even our Lord said himself may have fed that mentality in the disciples. For instance, Whenever we come to the New Testament, there was a number of times when Jesus said statements like this. He said to the woman at the well in John 4, verse 22, he said, salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship. You don't know what you worship, right? And then later on in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, Jesus said this to his disciples whenever they were sent out to preach. He says, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter in any city where the Samaritans are, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then in Mark 7, 26, whenever a Gentile woman was begging that her daughter would be delivered from a demon, Jesus tested her faith by telling her bluntly, I was sent only to the, little, to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. And then we know that even after his death and his resurrection, Until Israel fully and finally and officially rejected the claims of Messiah that we find in chapter 24, verse 47 of Luke, that repentance and forgiveness of sins was to be proclaimed to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So even in the words of Christ, you get this sense that there was a central focus on Israel and Israel alone. And that would have fed some of the thoughts of the disciples. Not fully understanding the plan of God and what God's purpose was to eventually reach the Gentile nations. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. 
There's probably no clearer example of this as God turns away from Israel, the nation Israel, and turns to the Gentiles. He turns from the nation Israel because they reject the Messiah. They reject the truth of Scripture. But God, in his eternal counsel and in his eternal plan, turns to the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 13 and verse 42, it says, Now when the Jews, this is Acts 13, 42, Now when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on the next Sabbath day. So here you have a group of Gentiles, Gentile pagans, if you will, that are begging for the gospel to be preached to them. And now in verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath day, in verse 44, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. In other words, they were like, no way, Jose. Not the prophet Hosea, but just the statement. They were saying, listen, you are not going to preach this to the Gentiles. That's our message. That's our gospel. That's our good news. So they were opposing Paul, trying to stop him, really, from preaching and teaching. Then in verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. I love that. They grew bold. Weren't going to stop them. And they said this. Listen to this. Verse 46. It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you, the Jewish people, the nation Israel, first. But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded, I have set you, the Jewish people, as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be salvation to the ends of the earth. In other words, that was their mission. That was the reason why God set them up to be a missionary nation to the nations. Yet they missed it, didn't they? They became ingrown. Us four no more bar the door. No one else comes in. They missed their purpose. They missed what God intended for them. So as a result of their rejection, God turns from the nation Israel, turns to the Gentiles. And in verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, They were glad. They glorified the word of the Lord. Now notice this. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Man, that's good. God was working marvelously, sovereignly, powerfully to begin to save the Gentiles. As you read through the book of Acts, you see his arm reaching out more and more and more. The gospel Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, is the very gospel that is the power of God that saves to the Jew first, then also to the what? The Greek. It wasn't just to the Jew. It was to the Jew and the Greek. God gave his first initial, if you want to call it this, invitation to Israel. They had received the covenants. They had received the laws. They had received the Messiah in the sense of God coming through Israel's lineage. But instead of reception of the Messiah, they rejected him, turned away from him, crucified him. And even to this very day, much of Israel remains in unbelief of their Messiah. Now, that was not the way God intends it completely, because all the way back in the Old Testament, God never, listen to this, never meant for the gospel to be exclusively the Jews only. He never intended it that way. In fact, you can read a passage over in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. I won't have you turn there. You can listen to it and you can hear it for yourself. On the day that the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem, there was a song of thanksgiving that was sung that included the reiteration of the duty of Israel to share the good news with all the nations. It says in 1 Chronicles 16, 8, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, and make known his deeds among the peoples. All the nations tell his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Later on in the same text, he uses the term all families of all peoples. In other words, that was God's intent for Israel to be a light to the Gentiles, to be a spokesman, if you will, for the glories of God and the words of God. But the Jews narrow, provincial, prejudicial attitude overlooked the Old Testament promises 
that God had given to them and the national mandate that God had given Israel to share his word with all nations. As far back as the covenant with Abraham, God promised him in you, that is in Abraham, how many families of the earth would be blessed? All families of the earth would be blessed. All of them. Commenting on that very promise, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 3.8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying all the nations will be blessed in you. In other words, this is plan A all the way. It's always been that way. God has always been inclusive in the sense of the peoples of the world. He has never been exclusive in the sense of the peoples of the world. He wants to save all peoples, all nations. In Deuteronomy 32, 21, God said of Israel, they have made me jealous. Made is, that is, Israel has made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me, that is God, to anger with their idols. So God says, all right, as a result of that, I will make Israel jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, which happens to be us. <laughs> Most of us who are here who are Gentiles, right? Romans 10, 19, the Apostle Paul appealed to this passage as proof that the gospel would be extended to the Gentiles. In Psalm twenty two twenty seven, David wrote, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. Psalm 102, 15, the psalmist added, So the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth for your glory. In Isaiah 49, 6, Isaiah predicted that God would make the Messiah the light of the nations so that his salvation may reach the end of the earth. We could go on and on and on. In Romans 15, 8, where the Apostle Paul emphasized this very plan of God to reach the Gentile nation, he says this, for I say, quoting Romans 5, 15, 8, he says, for I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promise given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles hope. Pretty clear, right? You know, Paul had a hard time with this too, but God worked in him, transformed and changed his thoughts on this. Now, with that said, you remember I quoted at the very beginning of the message, John 12, 32? Look at that with me just for a moment. Look at it with me at your Bible. It says this in John 12, 32. And I, if I am lifted up, from the earth will draw all to myself. Now, you should know now, based upon what we've already looked at in the text of Scripture, both the immediate context and the broader context of the whole of the Word of God, that God's intention behind this verse is He has the intention of drawing not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also. That's the reason why John introduces the Greeks there in verse 20, because there's nothing else told to us about them. They're there, and they want to see Jesus. We don't get the conversation. We don't get to listen in. We don't know what was said. But we do know that God has an interest in the Gentiles. God has a desire to save them. So he reminds us of that in this passage. In John 12, 32, Jesus says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, referring to his crucifixion that would soon be, I will draw all men to myself, whether they're Jew or Gentile, whatever nation they come from, doesn't matter. He will draw all kinds of people to himself. As I told you, many believe this to refer to uh, provenient grace. It does not. The word draw here in this text is the exact same word found over in John 6, where it says, no man can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. 
That word means to be drawn in the sense of efficaciously drawn to salvation. It's not just a general invitation, hope you guys come, I hope you'll show up kind of thing. It is a drawing by the Spirit of God whereby He opens your eyes, enables you to see, grants you faith, grants you repentance, and draws you to Himself. That is an efficacious drawing, a salvific drawing. And whenever we get to John 12, 32, John has not magically all of a sudden changed his mind about the word. The word means exactly the same thing. So you either have one of two choices. Either Jesus is being said there in chapter 12, verse 32, that he's he's saying that he's going to draw all men in the sense of universal salvation, or that he's going to draw men of all nations. Either one, but I know that universal salvation is not accurate. That can't be the case. One last thing as we close out this morning. As he does this tremendous work of salvation, and he draws all peoples, all kinds of people to Christ, it eliminates in the gospel itself racism. It eliminates prejudice. It it should banish. It should never be spoken on the lips of a believer. Because there's no greater example of the glorious gospel of Christ to bring the Jew and the Gentile together, the black and the white together, the male and the female together, the slave and the free together, than the gospel of Christ. Ephesians 2, let's turn there quickly. Ephesians 2.11. Ephesians 2, 11. Here's Paul's own words regarding this. Ephesians 2, verse 11. He says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh with hands. In other words, the Jews call you the uncircumcision. Verse 12 now, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a horrible condition to be in, right? That's where the Gentiles were. That's where you were in the same condition, outside the covenants, outside the promises, outside the hope, outside the commonwealth of Israel, outside the blessings that God was going to give. But then verse 13, it changes. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You were outside the covenants. Now you're brought into the covenants. Look at verse 14. Notice the word both that is used there a number of times. Look at verse 14. For he himself, referring to Christ, is our peace. The cessation of hostility, not only between God, but between the races. For he himself is our peace who has made both one. What both? The Gentiles and the Jews. And has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the hatred that is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Not one nation that are just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles. One nation. One of the two. Thus making peace, now verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the hatred or the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. We are completely united in Christ. We're one body, one people. I love what John 10, 16 said. You remember this? In John 10, 16, Jesus said, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I must also bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock. One flock. In John eleven fifty one, 51, when there was the prophecy of the high priest, he didn't even know what he was saying. But what he said there in John eleven fifty one. 51, now this he did not say of his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not only for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who is scattered abroad. 
Galatians 3, 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 9 says, since you have put off the old man and his deeds, since you're not acting like the lost person you used to be, and you've put on the new man who is renewed in Jesus Christ, according to the knowledge of him, he says in verse 11, There's neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but in Christ, all in all. We're all one in Christ. This is why John introduces the Greeks to us. It is another illustration of what's coming in the great work of Christ on the cross. He's bringing that one body that is divided. He's bringing it together in unity as one body in Christ. And by the way, as we finally get there, which will be a while yet, but when we finally get to John 17, and we talk about how the testimony of the body of Christ is exemplified in its unity and its love for one another, there is no greater example of the power of the gospel of Christ than to bring different people groups together under the same love of Jesus Christ. No greater example. And so with that, I hope that we will pray and ask ourselves a couple of questions, because I would ask you this. I'm definitely not one who's naive anymore regarding how people feel regarding these topics. I know sometimes they're controversial, and that's understandable. But I would tell you this, if you have any hint of that in your life, whether it's racism toward a different color or a different economic status or a different position or whatever it is, you need to repent of that today. You need to turn from that. That is as far away from God as you can get. The mind of God is not like that. The mind of Christ is not like that. But as a believer here, what do we have the responsibility to do as a church? Listen, Israel failed in its responsibility to be the light to the Gentiles. We're now given that task to be the light to the Gentiles. We're not only a light to the Gentiles, but we're a light to the Jews too. We're supposed to reach all of them now for Christ. Everybody for Christ. And you don't want to be found found guilty of the same thing the Israelites did where they became, you know, we're the only ones and we're the the select ones and that's it. We're not like the chosen frozen, right? We're not like that. We should be reaching out to all who are lost. Listen, if you qualify as a breathing sinner, then you are a person that we should love with the gospel of Christ. Amen? Let's pray together.